Hi everyone. So today we are going to continue our discussion on the categories of aesthetics. Um, we started talking about this a little bit before we went into e-lessons and each group was going to present on their aesthetic category, but obviously that didn't happen. So I'm going to go ahead and go over all of the categories of aesthetics with you. Um, at the end of this presentation, there is going to be a little attendance quiz for you, so make sure that you click on that link and answer those couple of questions, okay? So the first thing we want to talk about is just what aesthetics is, okay? So aesthetics in general is just kind of the philosophy of art, okay? The study of the nature and the value, and it's kind of what helps guide us towards our intelligent opinions about art, okay? Mm -hmm. It also helps us defend and appreciate or identify why other people view art differently. Okay, we know that everyone has their own opinions on art, um, but it's nice to kind of see it from somebody else's perspective because what I understand as art may not be the same as what you understand as art. Okay, so our five categories that we're going to talk about is imitationalism, formalism, emotionalism, instrumentalism, and institutionalism. Some examples of imitationalism would be this piece by Oscar Nilsson, okay? Now, imitationalism is artwork that really, really stresses things being realistically represented, okay? So you'll notice that the artist is trying to capture every little detail that they can. Now, this is actually a sculpture that has been created out of plastic, um, plasticine clay, which is kind of like modeling clay, and then silicone to create all of that realistic details that you see. Okay, another example of imitationalism. This is actually a painting created by Chuck Close titled Big Self Portrait. Okay, look at all those details that he has incorporated there. The wispiness of the hair, the reflection in the glasses. Okay, all of that detail is what makes this look almost like a photograph, but it's not. Okay, it is actually a painting. All right, our second category is formalism. Now, formalism is going to be completely opposite of Im imitationalism, all right? It's really going to stress the design over everything else, okay? So we're not worried about the meaning or the message or even the subject anymore. We're just really stressing those elements and principles in a work of art. So here is a piece by Jan Arp, right, created in 1962. So when I look at this sculpture, I really see an organic form, okay? I see a bronze color. I have a hard time figuring out what the subject is. I'm not sure if there's a meaning or message behind it, but I can tell that the artist is really just trying to capture an organic form, okay? Focusing purely on design. Another example would be a Louise Nevelson piece, Dawn's Wedding Chapel. Okay, so this is created all out of found objects. But if you notice, the artist actually whitewashed the entire thing. So it takes away the details. And we're really just stressing the color and the shapes. Okay, again, we're focusing just on those elements of design for formalism. All right, our third category is going to be emotionalism probably have an idea of where I'm going with this. Now, emotionalism, you have to get a response in terms of how your feelings or your moods or emotions have been invoked by that artist, okay? Again, it's the goal of the artist, though. This is a very famous painting by Pablo Picasso titled Guernica. Okay, and it was right after a bombing. So when we're looking at this, we're seeing anguish, we're seeing pain. Okay, the artist is really trying to depict that emotion with the shapes and the colors that they have chosen um, to depict that feeling. All right, next up we have a Tob Malm piece. So this is actually created out of a single steel bolt. Okay, and although this is kind of abstracted, you can tell the mood or the emotion that the artist is trying to depict, okay? You can see that kind of sloped over feeling, all right? I look at this, I don't feel happy, I feel sad, okay? It looks like this person is trapped and it looks like it's really trying to create that feeling inside of me. All right, our fourth category is instrumentalism. 
Now, instrumentalism can really be a lot of things, okay? Has several goals. Think of art being used as an instrument, whether it's for furthering a political point of view, okay? Maybe it's moral, social, religious, political, okay? Or maybe it's just there to better society. So this is a pretty um, famous piece of artwork titled Fearless Girl by Kristen Visible. Okay, now the other sculpture you see in the background is actually by a different artist and these two just happen to be displayed together and they kind of create a whole different uh, message that way. Okay, uh, another one we have is a Keith hearing piece. So when we look at this, we see um, our little figures with their arms stretched up almost worshiping that television. Okay, so take a look at this. What do you think the artist is trying to say um, with the way he depicts those arms in the air, the wings out, okay? And then our last one, which is very, very different than our other two, this is a Kagan Taylor piece titled Entangle. So this is actually kind of a for improvement of society piece, right? It's functional, it serves a purpose, but we still consider it art. Okay, and this is a really good category for this type of sculpture to fit under because it does improve society in some way. So that's why we consider this instrumentalism. Okay. All right, our last one is institutionalism, and this is definitely the most difficult to comprehend. Um, and even sometimes the artwork is hard to appreciate, um, but I'll try to persuade you with some examples. Okay, so institutionalism has really been designated art because an institution or an art body has told us so, okay? So if we were to take this artwork out of that institution, then it may no longer be viewed as art, okay? So this Janice Cunelis piece is untitled, all right, and it is burlap sacks that have been filled with various items. Now, if we saw that in the hallway at school or we saw that in the street, we probably wouldn't necessarily view it as art, but because of its location and because somebody important in art has told us that it's art, it persuades our opinion, okay? It doesn't mean we have to like it personally, but it does help persuade me to understand or believe why it is considered a piece of art, okay? This is a very famous piece of artwork. Um, titled The Fountain by Marcel Duchamp. You've probably seen it on my board a couple of times. So this was originally created in 1917, although the original has been lost and there's been several replicas made. Duchamp did not actually create this piece, okay? He actually entered it into a gallery and was turned down, but he said, he's an artist, I say it's art, you need to accept this, okay? So he created a lot of controversy because of that idea, right? And that's why as an art teacher, I appreciate it so much because he is kind of stirring the pot a little bit, trying to get people to question their value of art. But to me, this is an extremely valuable piece of artwork. Okay, this is gonna be our last piece and we're gonna talk a little bit more about this piece in a second. So this is Ava Hess's rope piece. Now, a lot of you I know just are viewing this as, ah, oh, it's just tangled up rope thrown in a pile. But a lot of times when we look at artwork, we just instantly judge it, okay? I do the same thing. I instantly judge it. I say whether or not I like it. But then I do try to dig a little bit deeper. So for Eva Hess, I really wanted to do a little more research to kind of figure out a little bit about her life and see why she creates the artwork that she does. So the next slide is a little bit about her biography and I'm gonna read through that with you. And then we're gonna look at this piece and I'm gonna see if hopefully your opinions have been persuaded a little bit. Okay, so Miss Hess's work reflects her traumatic life story. She was born in Nazi Germany. At two, she was sent for safety to the Netherlands with her older sister. They were reunited with their parents for emigration to the United States. Then they learned that Mrs. Hess's uncles and grandparents had died in concentration camps. Her mother had a mental breakdown. Her parents had a divorce. Her father was remarried. Her mother unfortunately committed suicide when she was not yet 10. Um, later, she had a failure in her own marriage and her father um, lost, her father passed away, sorry, before she lost her battle with brain cancer at the age of 34. 
okay? So think of all of this that's happening in her life at, before the age of 34, okay? I'm 35. This is a lot to deal with before 35, okay? When I look at this rope piece now, I'm picturing all of those battles, all of those things that are happening with in her, and this is her depiction of it. Okay, so by learning a little bit about the artwork, hopefully it has persuaded your opinion on this piece of art. Okay, had I just looked at this rope piece and not looked any more into it, I may not have viewed it as art, but because I tried to learn a little bit more, I truly appreciate this piece and I hope that you all kind of have gained a better understanding of that too. Okay, so Next, um, I am just going to have you answer a couple of questions on your attendance, and then you guys can be done for today.